installment in our faculty's research webinar series. My name is Professor Theodore Pietras. I'll be the chair for this afternoon session. And it is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to be able to lead the session where the focus of what we will be engaging and discussing on is going to center around the theme of research data management. Now, I'm sure that for many of us, as both active researchers and even as research supervisors, we do tend to overemphasize the data collection and the data analysis parts of the research process. And of course, for good reason, because those actually constitute really the backbone of the research projects that we either become involved with ourselves or that we help our students with getting through their particular research projects. That is where a lot of the emphasis, a lot of the focus is, is concentrated. But often overlooked is the issue of managing our research data. And that is what we are going to be trying to shed a little bit more light on in this afternoon session. And we have our three guest speakers who will be helping us to do just that. And in particular, we are going to be trying to wrap our heads around the following three core issues when it comes to data management. The first is trying to understand what is data management and why should research data be managed in the first place? Secondly, we can also look at how do we go about keeping our research data safe? And also questions around when is the right time for us to get rid of or destroy our data? As we know, this has become increasingly important, especially now in the COVID-19 era where a lot more of our data collection and our, our research activities are now moving into the online space. We also aware of the many, many problems of cybersecurity and um, hackers getting access to people's personal information, et cetera. So all of these kinds of issues, I would imagine, will also become very, very important for us as researchers to have to think about and, and strategize around how do we go about keeping our data safe in the virtual or online space. And then the third, the third area of focus is going to be looking at the safety of data within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm really looking forward to this afternoon session. I'm pretty sure that there will be quite a bit of engagement, many questions, and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing what our three speakers have to say on this issue. So without any further ado, I will start by introducing our first speaker for the afternoon, and that is Professor Michel Engelbrecht. Professor Engelbrecht is Director of the Center for Health Systems Research and Development, and she has been in that position for the past 24 years. Her research interests include the functioning of the health system with particular focus on the TB HIV co-epidemic, and now also the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the social and psychological or psychosocial aspects of these diseases and the responses of communities and government to them. So without any further ado, Professor Michelle Engelbrecht, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Peters. Um, I'm sorry, we switched around and Profi Tumeleng is going to start. I'll be last. I'm sorry about that. Oh, all right, no problem, no problem. Uh, Prof, Prof Tumi, are, are you ready to are you ready to start? Yes, that, that would be fine. Um, thanks, Prof. All right. Just all right. Okay. Let me let me just let me just briefly introduce you, and then then you can go ahead. All right. So, Professor Malo is a clinical psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychology. His research concerns understanding and promoting and psychological, psychological well-being well in an active context. He is also interested in research ethics 
and teaches quantitative research methods. Thank you, Professor Kumalo, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to, um, to speak with um, members of faculty. Um, if I may be allowed to share, to share my screen, um, I should actually figure that out first. I think we've got it now. All right, this should be, this should be fine, I think. Right. So um, research data management, um, I think it had been positioned as a neglected um, responsibility with, with a question mark. Um, I'm greatly honored to, to join my, my two colleagues, um, Michelle and Susan. Um, thanks for, for accommodating us. Now, let us look at the, the introduction. In the introduction, I wish to really give emphasis to two, two things, really. Um, that which I understand that we are trying to do here, as well as what the mandate um, coming from the faculty is about the specific uh, series, as well as the specific talk on this day. The first is that what ought to be the business of institutions of higher learning? Um, first, it has to be knowledge generation. Um, knowledge consumption and implications for practice ought to stem from our ability and capacity to generate knowledge. Um, if we agree that is indeed the case, and this is what our business is about, methodology and ethical research become critically important. At the same time, we need to acknowledge the overlap that is between um, the, the methodology of, our, of, of, of the science that we're busy with, as well as the the ethics of our own conduct, therefore making all research ethical research. And that is particularly important when we're going to look at how we handle um, our data. Uh, Professor Petrus um, quite correctly indicates that this is often not um, looked at rather than collection and analysis. However, the manner in which we manage and handle our data also has ethical implications. And that's, where from, that's the point of departure from which we, we need to come. Now, what is our mandate? Is to talk about data management, data storage, as well as data destruction. Um, in the context of this, indeed, um, I think this might have been phrased from the DS office, um, that the goal of this series ought to, to, to promote sound and quality research. We hope to achieve some sort of um, humble, contribution towards that um, this afternoon. The format has been set to be one of engagement, dialogue, self-reflection, and so on. Um, therefore, it is expected that we would like to have um, active participation. Now, what is my, then, my agenda? What are my goals? To some extent, I will describe what data management is. Uh, I'm not going to give a clear definition, but it ought to emerge out of our discussion, but I will certainly talk about why we need to do it, to some small degrees, how we do it, and I'm going to point out some special topics um, that also fall within the broader umbrella of, of data management. I'll certainly not be talking about COVID-19. I think one of my colleagues will, to, will do that. Um, I certainly know that um, Professor Engelbrecht will talk about the legal aspects, um, and I will not talk about data destruction. So what should be the context of this? What are some of the concerns um, that, should, that should bother us? We certainly know um, that you will start off at planning, then later collecting, analyzing, reporting, storing, and then destroying data. Then you think that you would have uh, conducted the full cycle and then, of course, reported um, your paper in a general article or wherever that, that it is needed to be communicated to, to the scientific community, right? But of concern here ought to be the centrality of replication. Um, therefore, fostering a sense of transparency in the science. This is absolutely critical to the work that, that we do um, as researchers. Um, secondly, the implications for the populations being, being researched um, also um, hinders or, or hinges on, on how we manage uh, that data. 
There's, of course, implications for the reputation of yourself as the researcher. Um, there is also a lot of weight that should be uh, put on the, the capacity or the responsibility to promote good science for greater good, all right? Um, therefore, the opposite of that we will not even talk about, right? Um, and critically important that we have moved from paper formats um, of, of data to computerized methods, and increasingly so. In fact, I find that we, we need to embrace this computerization um, of, of the, the work that we do more and more, right? Um, and there's also this concern of what I call the critical eye of the research monitors. And these are people like the RECs and so on, whether we like them or not. There ought to be um, research partners um, with us. Um, and even they would miss this, um, this aspect of the process. You know, they would want to perhaps check how you're going to collect your data and so on. But whoever comes back and says, but how have you managed your data in an ethical fashion. Um, and of course, what role should journals and funders play in this specific area um, of work? Um, and once you have run the whole data um, life cycle, uh, perhaps even before, especially before destroying it, you want to think about the possible use of, this, of the data as secondary for secondary data analysis, whether it be through sharing with others or even the possibility of reusing the data in other novel ways, right? What are the special um, possible topics that we may be concerned with? Um, I, I wanted to draft this, this list and I thought I might arrive at maybe four or six. Um, we ended up with about 18 of these. So let's just go through them quickly, really. And, and you'll see the importance of being able to manage data effectively and in an ethical fashion because of all of these um, little special issues that arise along the way. The first is missing data, which I will talk about later on, and I believe that colleagues will also talk about this. Supplemental data. How many of you now uh, you know, want to publish with journals and editors write back to you and say, but you need to provide your data. We need to know what the raw data look like, how you arrived at the results um, of, of, of what you are reporting in your, in your paper. Data ownership and responsibility. For example, if you're working in the uh, indigenous knowledge systems uh, realm, you know that you, you're not only talking or being engaged with, um, with participants, but these are knowers, these are people whose information and knowledge critically belongs to them. You know, how do we share um, our, our data, or their data, you know, it's ownership, and what is our responsibility as far as that is concerned? There will be issues about um, the, the story sharing and management of qualitative data. Then with quantitative data, it's easy. You've got spreadsheets um, and very advanced um, uh, statistical uh, software and programs that can do this. But what are the qualitative researchers doing with qualitative data? Similarly, with visual participatory methods, um, how are these, are the data from there stored uh, or managed? the issue of informational technology, hardware and software, this increasing advancement of this. Um, some companies have become really smart and started uh, making these open, open source so we can simply get on the net and start using programs such as R and others, um, but others continue to charge a lot of money uh, for these um, technology software. The critical issue of cleaning data in an ethical and, and responsible manner um, is, is one that is also critically important. What about this question of commission research? You've got a private company or even government who are actually paying you uh, to conduct um, some research for them. You co-own the data. Uh, you may also use it for your academic purposes, but what would be the ethics and the tension between um, yourself and other parties regarding the management of that data. Of course, um, 
I know Susan will talk about big data. Um, um, as we continue, um, what about when we have systematic reviews, the so-called desktop research? It has been put across as, well, you can easily do this and sometimes even skip the REC um, and so on. But what becomes our responsibility there as far as managing uh, what is essentially uh, data, even though it is so-called in the public arena, um, we didn't have access to the primary data that allowed that allowed for the production of those um, published pieces of work that you are now using in your systematic reviews, etc. Right, data quality um, assurance. Okay. Um, at number 12, online research participation, as it is increasingly becoming prominent. Uh, dissemination of findings. I find this a fascinating thing because when you are going to be sharing information with, um, with the public, how is this packaged, how is this managed, and so on. So this also falls in here, right? Secondary data analysis, as mentioned. E-research, where uh, artificial intelligence uh, is beginning to be quite prominent there. Reporting the results and findings, as well as the political correctness um, of, of reporting uh, even adverse um, results, right? How about sensitive research topics, such as childhood sexual violence? How do you go about managing um, data that um, touches on some of, some of these things? And lastly, the ethics of analysis in publication. So think about that. If you think that you can actually come up with about 18 possible special topics, why do we not have texts? Why do we not have courses that are specifically dedicated to, um, to data management? All right. So let's now let's talk about why this is important. All right. Well, it's about really the questions about the robustness and the and the rigor of, of our results. You know, we find more and more the overrepresentation of positive results in the literature. Uh, notwithstanding that, um, general editors tend to be more biased towards this. Um, nevertheless, there's also um, little variety and flexibility as far as data analysis approaches are, are, are concerned, and there is low levels of statistical power in the reported results. So when you find such problems with published data, a critical question needs to be about how data were managed. Right? Um, and, and when the results are published, very often there will not be publication of data and supporting material. And there will be no way of anyone verifying the scientific process that culminated in the results that are being reported in this journal article or wherever else you are publishing. Therefore, it is important because it touches on the questions about practices of data sharing and transparency. So if we agree that this is important, why aren't people doing it? Um, a survey by Borgian van Gulik um, listed uh, the most uh, cited reasons for this, the least cited reasons, as well as the limitations. Let us look at that. The most cited reasons for actually doing the right thing is to protect the loss of data. This is what researchers report. They want to protect their own data from being lost, all right? They also have a desire to foster reproducibility or replicability, all right? So as you know, this is the backlog of science that the process that has been followed should be able to be um, replicated. Um, and they want to foster the, the principle of transparency. So big ups to them. But let us now see why those who are not doing it are not doing it. They cite that there is poor institutional support. So universities all over the world need to wake up um, to this idea that data need to be managed in a responsible and ethical manner for the purposes of science and need to do as best as they need, as they should, uh, to support um, their researchers. Second, the availability of training. And once again, this falls on the shoulders of the institutions, I think, and as well as their own guidance from their collaborators or principal investigators. That, that's an issue that falls within research teams, really. 
Um, and those who claim some obstacles that are preventing them from good practice claim that it takes a lot of time. Of course it does, and it should, but we must invest time in it. Um, they talk that there is lack of professional incentives. I don't know what if I would agree with that. Um, there's lack of institutional support. We have talked about this as well as training. So the institutions can really um, come to the party here. And the reasons for some of them refusing to share data, they claim confidentiality, especially about sensitive information. They also claim that in that data sense, there's additional information that they still need to, to work on, which is perfectly fine. But you wonder why doesn't a person like that split that data and make available that which should be shared at that particular time. And very often they would not have gotten approval from their research ethics committees to do this sharing of work um, with you know, colleagues elsewhere leaving it um, available for, for other researchers or even making available to, to, to journals. Therefore, the RECs also need to look at something like this, okay? So what can be done? First, training, of course. Second, provide services and infrastructure, including support. Thirdly, let us be efficient. That will be the opposite of bureaucracy or red tape. Those are responsibilities at institutional level. But what should researchers then do? Um, it, it boils down to complete documentation. So keep a well-organized copy or copies of all project files. Keep read-only copies of data files in the original attached forms. Um, create a researcher-friendly, almost a, a, a command or instruction manual about how everything was documented and how it should be worked through. And lastly, keep a concise folder um, of all documents for replication purposes that correspond with the final version of the results that will be um, reported. If we continue with the responsibilities of the researchers, we find that continued documentation, but data sharing should be the case. And firstly, you need to recognize that data management is in fact a behavior. It's not a set of tools. It goes beyond just having um, a number of spreadsheets. It's about how you conduct yourself here, right? Engage with experts, find out what about policies, expectations, definitions of this and the other, right? As well as define exactly what you are going to do with your data from the onset. Some people plan this. In fact, most of us should do this. You plan for this even before you collect your data. What data should be collected in what form? What is going to be done with it with them, right? And implement standardized protocols that state precisely how data are going to be organized, saved, and documented. All right. Um, fifth, create a document that outlines the practices and share this with collaborators. Then therefore you create a culture of proper, responsible, ethical data management within your teams, your research teams. Um, and then lastly, recognize the value of your data. It is indeed the most important ingredient and product of your research. Now, the issue of big data um, is collected by machines, it's in real time, no retrospective subjective reporting, and it uh, occurs at multi-level it has got it's got an ability for multi-level um, capacity, right? Um, I'm not going to to explain this as I know that Susan is going to touch on it. Um, it is defined by volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. I think there's also a fifth V. Um, but now it's important that you understand the the nature um, with which. Um, the data could be received to be unstructured or it could be structured such that it's ready for the spreadsheet. It could also be semi-structured or blended. All right. So it is really about how you acquire it, how you store it, and how you manage it. Regarding um, acquisition, social media, other digital platforms, but also publicly available data, um, as well as the protected to be requested um, data. I mean, if, we, if we think about uh, great data, for example, that we need to ask for, um, 
the, the terms and conditions as well as the ethics of data acquisition and sharing. And then, of course, how to analyze data. Some researchers have um, suggested that the same approach with the splitting, analyzing, and meta-analyzing your data could be the case. How do we then store and ask questions? How and where to store data? What are the expected sizes of the data? How should the data be organized? How will data be accessed for analysis? And how will it be distributed? Right. And of course, there's a, these critical questions that I think Susan might respond to about, you know, do I, for example, use uh, my, my, my computer's ordinary memory or do I go for these internet based um, you know, platforms? Right. But programs are available. I hear R has, has capacity for big data, which is wonderful. So does Python. And these will be functions that are available in the two. Uh, programs. I haven't used any of them. Now, question: the question of dissemination, and I'm close to, to, to the end now. Th there's this question of dissemination, as I mentioned at the beginning, that researchers would wish to share information with the general public or the community. The questions um, that sh should be asked for, 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 for concrete decision making should be, what information should be included? when I share in a dissemination activity with the community. Who should deliver this material? What should be emphasized, especially about the benefits of our research? Some researchers oversell, right? How should the material be packaged? How should it be tailored for different audiences? Don't take jargon to ordinary people that you'd otherwise use in your scientific community. And whose information is it anyway? Missing data. So many journals require that you report how you managed missing data. They want to know the nature of the missing data, the procedure you used to manage the missing data, the potential sources and patterns of the missing data. Now, it could be missing completely at random, which I think will be better. So it's absolutely random. There's no pattern. It's not related to any specific variables. It could be missing at random, meaning that the probability of missing is related to a specific variable. It could be sex or gender. It could be race. Uh, it could be a particular item in a, um, in a questionnaire uh, or not missing at random. So the, the, there's a pattern to this missingness uh, as a result, perhaps, of the kind of non ignorable um, non responses, all right, which we can, can talk about. So, the mechanisms of dealing with this thing. Some people simply delete list wise or pair wise. It is not advisable that we do this, even if you swear that you will report what you, what you deleted. Some still use these substitution methods, um, substitute. Um, a particular participant's score with a mean of the of the group, or even do regression substitution, pattern matching imputations. These are also they're slightly better than deleting, but they are also not ideal. Some packages now have this full information maximum likelihood method, which would then replace um, a value, a missing value, by computing a case-wise likelihood using the observed variables in each of the cases, including the patterns of the missing data with the particular um, information of, a part of that specific case that it is looking at. This tends to be a little more sophisticated and it will in the future really, really be more, more preferred. Um, colleagues, thank you so much. Um, you've seen the, the references, with this, I'm trying to make a point that even if you're standing at exactly the same point, your sense of focus, in this case, on data, would determine if you see the picture clearly or not. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much from our first speaker, Professor Kumalo. A uh, very, very interesting and insightful paper. I will ask colleagues to just make notes of your questions or comments. And once we have given all three speakers an opportunity to present their papers, then uh, I will open up the floor for any questions or comments from the, uh, the colleagues in attendance. So our next speaker is Dr. Susan Brokenshaw. She is a senior lecturer in the Department of English. Her research interests include linguistic and non-linguistic aspects of behavior and communication in off and online contexts. As an applied linguist, her areas of expertise include discourse analysis, critical discourse analysis, conversation analysis, and pragmatics. Thank you, Dr. Brokenshaw. Over to you. Thank you so very much, Professor. I just would like to know, are you all able to see my screen? Has it appeared? Uh, Susan, I can see it. I don't know if, if, if the other colleagues can, but I can see it. Okay. <clears throat> it's clear from my side as well, okay. uh, Dr. Brokenshaw. Thank you so very much, and thank you so much um, for um, listening to my sh very short presentation. I have been uh, ill recently, uh, so for that reason, I'm not going to uh, put my uh, video on. Uh, now, my presentation focuses on data management, but within a qualitative research paradigm, as I am, of course, a qualitative researcher working in the humanities and in the area of qualitative uh, social science research. I pay attention to the management of big data in this presentation, uh, particularly because it is an emerging technology that is used and critiqued by scholars uh, in diverse disciplines. I am interested in how we perceive data, um, since it is my view that um, how we perceive it has an influence on how we then manage and ultimately analyze it. Some years ago, I became increasingly aware that traditional qualitative researchers needed to know how to manage big data, as well as how to interrogate both its epistemological and its ethical consequences. And this awareness culminated in a book that I published along with two colleagues, Professor Kortzer and Dr. Seneca, in 2019. Entitled Reinventing the Social Scientist and Humanist in the Era of Big Data. Much of this presentation is therefore based on research that we did when writing this book. So, my presentation today is a fairly philosophical one uh, where I follow a humanistic approach. Now, it is important, uh, in my view, to describe or uh, to, to consider rather how we describe big data as this influences how we manage and analyze it. The way in which the media and technology experts describe big data highlights two metaphors that Pushman and Burgess 2014 argue have become dominant, namely that big data is a force of nature to be controlled and that big data is nourishment or fuel or even oil uh, to be consumed. Now, the message behind um, the first conceptual metaphor um, is that Although big data is overwhelming, it can nevertheless be converted into a resource if effectively controlled. However, data is not a natural resource that replenishes itself, but is created by users with intentions that are entirely unrelated to its use as a valued um, commodity. So in other words, big data cannot be perceived as a value neutral resource when it is managed because its value differs depending on whether we are referring uh, to its owners such as 
as, let's say, Amazon or Facebook, the generators or the collectors, such as researchers. Now, the message behind the second metaphor is essentially that big data is a resource that needs to be consumed like oil and that its consumption requires very little conscious interpretation or reflection. These two metaphors reflect a conflict between two paradigms, the big data paradigm in which data is seen as neutral, existing entirely independently of context, and an older paradigm in which data is perceived to be socially constructed. Now, the first paradigm suggests that meaning surpasses context, that anyone with a reasonable understanding um, of statistics should be able to interpret data without context or domain-specific knowledge. Kitchen 2014 refers to this as a conceit uh, on the part of big data analysts who are now undertaking social science and humanities research sometimes without regard to the subject matter expertise required in these fields. Um, on the subject of conceit, um, let me just quickly go to the slide that I want to look at. So apologies for that. Um, on the subject of conceit, qualitative researcher Annette Markham notes that at one stage, she was asked the following questions uh, by a big data analyst. How can we make qualitative research more important in the arena of big data? If big data is the purview of quantitative and computational analysts and qualitative researchers do not want to be left behind, how can they better uh, inform big data research and researchers? Now, such questions are actually based on two faulty assumptions. Um, with regard to the first one, that it is only quantitative researchers who can manage and use big data. Data in the humanities and the social sciences can also be big. It is not just about the size of the data, however, and size is in any case only one of several defining dimensions of big data. Uh, the second erroneous supposition is that qualitative research has no place in big data management. But as Kathy Mills observes, qualitative research are well positioned to generate research questions as well as to select, curate, interpret and theorize big data away from reductionist claims. Now, I just want to very really briefly speak about managing and, and how we think about the size of big data. Uh, qualitative researchers might ask questions such as these. Is it necessary for qualitative researchers to collect enormous amounts of data to achieve their objectives? In other words, is the analysis of large data sets theoretically justified? Will the demand for big data projects result in the demise of small data studies? Well, scholars suggest that researchers need to determine if coding a huge data set has any inherent value, since it may have limitations in terms of validity and scope. Uh, a given sample, no matter how large, may not be representative of a specific population, making generalizability of results difficult, if not impossible. One need only think about Twitter, for example, which may not be representative of a given population because some account users may be bots and not human beings. Researchers warn that we should not be seduced by the notion that huge data sets, as opposed to small ones, will yield more reliable and meaningful findings. Since size is relative in the world of big data and is not linked solely um, to volume. Small data can in fact be quite large in size. What this means is that small data sets can be pooled to create larger data sets. It is worthwhile noticing that when it comes to data management, very large data sets may generate dirty or biased data, which in turn will of course impact negatively on validity. Now, in terms of assessing data quality, um, to date, glue flu trends or GFT, as it's also known, is arguably the most well-known big data gaffe 
of the millennium, attempting to accurately forecast the outbreak of influenza in some 25 odd countries from 2008 onwards, this web service was about 140% off in its predictions in 2013 due to flawed uh, algorithmic dynamics. In addition to human error and misinterpretation of the data, GFT did not take into account that online users searching for cough, headache or fever, for instance, might have been looking for information on topics that are not related to influenza-related illnesses. To be of value to scholarship, any big data that is managed should be accurate and of high quality. Uh, together with um, my two colleagues who wrote the book, I reviewed a study by Kai and Zhu, this is uh, 2015, who have proposed what is a useful data quality framework to assess the quality of data managed. Any scholar new to big data needs to first be aware that big data can't be simplistically defined as data that is too large to fit into an Excel spreadsheet, for example. Big data sets reflect distinct features or vectors um, commonly referred to as the five Vs, uh, which Professor Kumalu um, already touched upon. Now, with these vectors in mind, Kai and Zhu suggest that analysts use the hierarchical data quality framework, and it's illustrated um, on the slide that you see there. Uh, although the framework was designed for commercial purposes, I would like to argue that it may be adapted to suit different research environments in the sense that academics may simply uh, select data quality dimensions that will help them achieve their research research objectives. So uh, looking at that slide, let us consider a scenario in which social scientists would like to explore, let's say, the attributes of civil versus uncivil discourse online. To achieve this goal, they decide to collect posts generated by commenters on online news sites. When it comes to determining quality dimensions, the need for them to take timeliness accuracy and completeness into account will obviously be prioritized. Since social media data is raw data, it will also be necessary to assess its credibility. Dimensions such as consistency and integrity will not be particularly useful to them since social media data is generally unstructured. The next step will be for them to select indicators for every dimension chosen. Thus, for example, in terms of timeliness and completeness, they will have to be aware that commenters' posts on online news sites are regularly updated and that they will therefore have to make sure that they access and download the latest posts so that their data set is complete. They also have to ensure that they do not uh, miss the window of opportunity for downloading data since online news outlets may close down comment sections at specific times and without any prior warning. Assessing the quality of each dimension will allow the researchers to determine if they are satisfied with the baseline standard. If the baseline standard is satisfactory, they will draft a quality report and then enter the data acquisition phase during which the data is scrubbed or cleaned with the aim of detecting and removing errors and inconsistencies from data in order um, to improve their quality. Now, I won't say too much about ethics, since it is a topic that Professor Engelbrecht will be touching upon, um, but I would like to say that perhaps one of the oldest big data studies uh, to showcase ethical dilemmas uh, is by Michelle Hogg and her colleagues, um, who published an article in the Journal of Spatial Science in 2016, using uh, a statistical inference technique known as geographical profiling, uh, which is essentially employed to find individuals suspected of serious crime, such as murder and terrorism. This team attempted to track down a well-known um, graffiti artist 
based in the United Kingdom, Banksy, uh, who prefers to stay entirely out of the public eye. The researchers even mined electoral rolls and other public websites to trace not only the artist's former residential addresses, but also those of his wife. As researchers Metcalf and Crawford 2016 point out, uh, there are many questions that could be asked of the study, not least about, by the way, the correlation between gravity and terrorism. But for our purposes, they say, we will focus only on the ethical note that appeared at the end of the article. The authors are aware, this is apparently what the team said, the authors are aware of and respectful of the privacy um, and they removed the subject's name and his relatives and have thus only used data in the public domain. Now, I will speak briefly about the public-private space issue, as many of us, myself included, would love to simply argue um, that we don't need consent uh, to collect data that is in the public domain. Let me just move on to this slide here. But it is not possible to view the private public space in terms of a straightforward dichotomy. Um, a good practice is therefore to perceive the public private space along a continuum in order to assess any risks uh, to the human subjects under investigation. So the scale you see there was developed by Jang and Callingham in 2012. And um, I myself have found it to be a very useful one when it comes to assessing ethics variation and risk in the context of data management. So if a researcher, let's say, opts to collect commenters' posts uh, to Man and Guardian online, um, then in terms of the scale in the table, the site constitutes a semi-public space for a number of reasons. First, the site is open to anyone, but readers who wish to discuss an article um, are required to sign in with Facebook, Twitter, Google, Discus, or Thought Leader, for example. Second, their comments can be read by anyone who visits the new site. Clearly then, looking at the scale, commenters' acts are overt with identifiable information. Third, comments made may be sensitive in nature if they are made in relation to a contentious topic discussed in a given online news article. According to some scholars, it is only research into private and semi-private domains, uh, such as closed chat rooms or email correspondence, that requires informed consent from the participants. Some also suggest that either public or semi-public spaces can be studied without um, obtaining any informed consent. So that's pretty much it um, from my side then, just touching on a few areas that I believe qualitative scholars, but all other scholars uh, should pay attention to when it comes to uh, data management. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Susan Brokenshaw. Another very interesting and fascinating paper. Then our third and final speaker for this afternoon is Professor Michelle Engelbrecht. She is the director of the Center for Health Systems Research and Development and has been in that position for the last 24 years. Her research interests include the functioning of the health system with a particular focus on the TB HIV co-epidemic and now the COVID pandemic, as well as the social and psychosocial aspects of these diseases and the responses of communities and government. Thank you very much, Professor Engelbrecht. The floor is yours. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you, for Professor Petrus, for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to share my um, presentation with you today. Just, are you able to see it? Yes, the slides are clear, Professor. You can continue. Thank you very much. So my presentation today is going to be about data security, 
with tension and destruction. And a lot of this you probably already know. And I think my presentation might be more practical about certain steps that we can take and how we can get assistance with this. So first of all, we need to acknowledge in South Africa is governed, and elsewhere as well, is governed by a number of existing legal instruments and provisions. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights state that everyone has the right to bodily and psychological integrity, which includes the right not to be subjected to medical or scientific experiments without their informed consent. In addition, the National Health Act requires all research projects that involve human participants to obtain the express consent of the individual involved and to be conducted in the prescribed manner. This prescribed manner relates to any regulations which further govern research, in particular, the South African Department of Health's guidelines on ethics and health research, which don't, which don't just apply to health research, but to all research that uses human participants. And this research requires prospective and independent ethics review before starting. In addition, on the 1st of July of this year, the Protection of Personal Information Act came into effect. And this act has implications for all research activities that involve the collection, processing, and storage of personal information. At the university, we also have guidelines and policies in place. For example, the guidelines and standard operating procedures that we follow from the ethics committees. We also have a policy on information security for users of information from ICT. And then we have a research data management policy from the library. But the big question on all us researchers' minds is POPIA. And what is the impact going to be on our research activities? And I don't at all pretend to even be an expert on this. I have learned a lot through reading, and I'm going to share with you what I understand about POPIA. POPIA aims to improve the transparency, accountability, and oversight of personal information and promote public trust in the use of information in research. However, there is uncertainty and the need for further guidance on the application of Papier to research. For example, it is unclear how some of the high level principles will apply to research. And secondly, although Papier adopts a principle based approach and not a sector specific approach to the processing of personal information, it does provide certain exceptions for research. In addition to understanding Papier better, the Academy of Science of South Africa is leading a process to develop a code of conduct for research um, that will help us understand how to apply the act to our research. And we are hoping that this will come out later this year. So then how do we keep our research data safe? The law surrounding data security and privacy is a complex issue. It is designed to ensure data is processed in a way which minimizes risk to privacy. And there are key core principles that we should adhere to. So firstly, if we want to understand the law in terms of POPIA, there are some basic principles that we should adhere to. Firstly, de-identify data. De-identification is when you store the personal information of research participants in an unidentifiable format. For example, you, should, you could collect anonymous data. If your project does not require that you know the identity of your research participants, then don't collect any information that will be, identify them. Secondly, de-identify your information as soon as you can. So sometimes you may need to know at the start of your study who your research participants are. However, if at a later stage you no longer need to know this, you can de-identify your information. Another alternative is to mask the identity of your research participants by using pseudonyms or codes when referring to them in your data. Collect as little information as possible. Make sure that the personal information you collect is relevant to your project. You could ask, we can ask ourselves some key questions. Why are we collecting this personal information and how are we going to use it? Can we achieve our goals without collecting this information? 
So I think we're moving away from the stage where we collect what's nice to know to collecting only what we really need. We should be transparent and ensure that research participants are well informed about the purpose of the research and how we're going to use their personal information. We also need to make sure that fellow researchers in our team are aware of the privacy risks for the participants and that the steps that we're taking to mitigate against those risks. So in this regard, right from the start, we, before we even collect any data, we have to draw up our research data management plans, and these need to be transparent so that everybody knows exactly what their roles and responsibilities are. And then we need to keep our information safe. We need to safeguard our research data against unauthorized access, use, loss, or destruction. For example, we need to use a secure environment for storing and sharing files, and we need to make sure that we follow university policies and procedures. In this regard, we need to have policies and procedures for access to personal information, including physical access, computational infra infrastructure, and network access. There also should be policies and procedures for access to personal information when working off-site, particularly if we are working on a less secure network than when we are at the university. There needs to be physical security safeguards in place, such as locks and anti-theft systems, automatic updates of antivirus software on all our storage devices, encryption of storage and transmission mechanisms, including our emails, the level of security measures should increase when the risk is high. For example, if we're collecting personal information about the health of a research participant, we would definitely need to keep that very safe and secure if we had identifying information in there. We need policies and procedures for the correct disposal of paper and or electronic personal information. And it's important that we back up our data, that we, that we keep this in a controlled and secure environment as well. So in short, the simplest way to protect our data is to make sure that we're not keeping anything that we don't need. And it's for this reason that we have retention policies in place and we are conscious about deleting or anonymizing data once its usefulness has passed. So I'd just like to refer to the UFS research data management policy, which covers many of these issues that I've raised. It says that all research data in digital non-digital and computer readable format should be stored securely. Securely, It should be stored with adequate metadata so that we can easily identify what it was used for and that it can be reused. It should be deposited in the university repository and um, we do have access to Figshare and if anybody would like to deposit the, their data there, they should be in contact with the library about this. And finally, non-digital research data which cannot be digitalized, should be labeled and stored securely as well, so that it can be easily accessed. So in, in, in addition to all these security levels and policies that we need to be aware of, we are also confronted with the COVID-19 situation. And as the pandemic continues, it's important to recognize the fluctuating nature of the situation and to remain flexible depending on current lockdown regulations. As such, researchers need to, may need to visit their data management plans in order to adhere to national lockdown regulations and to infection control and prevention measures. We should only go out into the field when necessary to collect critical and essential data and not to unnecessarily duplicate data collections. And especially now that we are moving more to online data collection methods, we need stronger and more stringent data management systems and processes in place. But COVID-19 has definitely brought to the fore the importance of data sharing. Research data is a valuable resource and the strengths and benefits of sharing such data are firmly established. Information sharing is critical elements of an effective response to an infectious disease outbreaks. And given the public health imperative to accelerate an effective COVID-19 response, the importance of promoting ethical and equitable data sharing has increased during this pandemic, as well as during previous pandemics as well. International funders such as the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have mandated that funding recipients share their data from research related to COVID 
as soon as their study is completed, regardless of the publication status. And while researchers are rushing to pull resources and data sets to tackle the pandemic, the new area of, era of openness comes with concerns around privacy, ownership, and ethics. So some tips for sharing data during the age of coronavirus and beyond. Curate your data, we must curate our data contributions and make sure that we provide enough metadata as well as any necessary code that is needed to process our data. When depositing data concerning human participants, we must make sure that we have the appropriate ethical and legal approvals and the data must be properly anonymized and de-identified. We should also take care when using data collected by other researchers. We need to make sure that we understand the context in which the data was collected, not just the raw data, but also the protocols and how and where the data was collected and what the purpose was for it. If it's not clear from any accompanying documentation, we should get in touch with the researchers responsible for collecting that data. And then again, of course, we need to be aware of any legal obligations. Retention periods for research data may be influenced by a number of factors. Firstly, funding body requirements, who generally require that data be stored for a minimum of five years. Legislative or regulatory inclements, according to Popia, records of personal information must not be retained any longer than is necessary for achieving the purpose for which the information was collected or subsequently processed. However, this does not apply in the case of research. We also have our university policy on data management, which states that all research data should be held for a maximum period of 10 years, provided appropriate safeguards are in place. For data used in postgraduate research, it should be stored for a maximum of three years. But these regulations, again, are dependent on any contractual obligations that we have with research with the funders. Um, if the results of the study are contentious or might be challenged, we should keep it for longer. And research that has a public interest or heritage value, we might not want to destroy at all. So if we come to data destruction, the secure destruction of research data involves using irreversible methods to ensure that the data is no longer usable. It is particularly critical that confidential or sensitive data remains unreasonable. Digital data, we shouldn't just go about deleting files because nothing is ever just gone. It may be necessary to utilize software that permanently erases data. And in this regard, it's important that we work with our ICT department so that we understand what are the best alternatives. All non-digital data should be physically destroyed using appropriate methods which are as secure and environmentally friendly as possible. So if we are still using something like paper-based questionnaires, we shouldn't just discard them in the rubbish bin or in a recycle bin, but we should actually shred all documentation. And then finally, this is again stated in our UFS data management policy, the timing, manner, and recording of research data disposal and destruction should already be included from the start in our data management plan. We need to review our research data and to determine whether or not it is ready to be destructed or should we keep it still. The destruction and disposal of research data should be in line with any ethics, legal, regulatory and contractual obligations. And finally, we should keep a record of when the data was destructed and why. Um, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Professor Engelbrecht, for, for that paper. Okay, colleagues, we have now had the opportunity to listen to our three speakers, and now I am opening up the floor for any uh, questions or comments that any of our attendees would like to pose to our speakers. And then also even for our speakers themselves, if, if they would like to pose some questions to each other, uh, which I think would also add some extra, some extra energy to the discussions. I do understand that there is another meeting that some of our, of our speakers as well as our other colleagues that might be in attendance also need to attend at half past three. 
So we may actually finish the session a little bit before half past three so that we can give our colleagues a chance to get themselves ready for, for the next meeting. Uh, but nevertheless, the floor is now open. So what I will do is I will ask, if you would like to ask a question that you do hand, and I will then acknowledge you and then give you the opportunity to raise your question or to make your comment. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any any hands raised as yet. Uh, I will kick off the the questions with uh, one of my own, and this is directed to all three of our of our speakers. And the question is: Is data management only the responsibility of the researcher? And I pose this question within the context of uh, what we in in social research would uh, would consider. Uh, participatory action research or similar types of research where the research we do has active collaboration and involvement of our research participants with us in the research process. So if we involving our research participants from the, the initial stages of the research process all the way through to the final writing of the research report, dissemination of the results, Etc. Then, does that then mean that part of the data management responsibility should then also rest on the shoulders of our participants as our fellow collaborators and co-creators of this knowledge that we are producing? So that's just a question there for for our panel. And then I see there's a there's a hand here by uh, from Neo. Neo, please unmute yourself. And state your question. Thank you, Prof. I think that uh, my question is a little bit related to yours. Um, so in my view, I see um, participants as co-researchers, and this is probably related to Prof. Kumalo's um, data ownership um, bullet. Um, and in seeing um, participants as core researchers, you know, um, they then um, are afforded an expert position. They are elevated from the passive role of just, you know, being the one that's just giving the information. And then they walk away from the research and you as the researcher, you know, take this information from them. But they, they then really become active participants in... Um, you know, the whole research process. So for me, in terms of um, data ownership and ethics, I'm wondering about my, my sample who are student leaders who really actually ask, if not demand, to be named. Um, they want to be named because that gives them that, you know, they, they then... Um, almost, how can I say, they feel legit legitimized as, you know, um, active uh, uh, um, expert contributors to this research. So if we need to use um, pseudonyms um, for ethical purposes and, you know, and, and confidential uh, reasons, um, where is the line in terms of managing the data? I'm also thinking about victimization of, you know, for example, student leaders and anyone who can give sensitive information. Um, still in the context of this question. Um, so how do we manage this data in such a way that we can give our participants, you know, that um, expert role as co-researchers, but still... Um, protect them from whatever harm that that they can come to them because they are named on their request. Great, thank you for that, Neil. All right, over to our our speakers. If you would like to respond, thank you. Um, may I start? 
Yes, please go ahead, Michelle. I'm going, um, Prof. Peters, I'm going to start with your question about data management and if you're including your participants as co-researchers. I think that's where it's very important we, we're doing collaborative research to already include that in our data management plan from the start so that everybody understands their roles and responsibilities. And that will come through not just in your data management plan, but then also when you're gaining informed um, consent from your participants as they will know exactly uh, you know, what role they're playing, what is expected of them, et cetera. And I also know that in terms of POPIA, it becomes even more important to include that information and even more than what we are already including in our informed consent. So yes, I do think we should definitely, if that's the nature of your research, they should be included and also take responsibility for data collection and management. Any responses from our other two speakers? Yes, Dr. Brokenshaw. Yes, um, I think it's such an interesting question. Um, I can really only speak uh, from the position of my own context, uh, particularly when it comes to supervising students in an education field. Um, most of the research participants that my students study are children. Um, and so obviously for that reason, um, it's difficult um, in a sense to elevate them as, as, as you know, co-researchers, obviously. But I think when it comes to that context, it is then simply uh, important to um, keep the parents of those children in the loop at every single point uh, about the data management process. Um, while a child um, can't give consent, we speak about child assent, um, it's nevertheless important um, that at every point of the data management process, the children continue uh, to be comfortable with the data collected. And I think very importantly, that parents are made aware and are reassured that uh, the data will be kept confidential and very important uh, because this has come up um, in my context several times. Parents are particularly concerned when audio visual recordings are made. And one of the first questions they tend to ask my students is, but will this data be destroyed at some stage? So um, I'm not speaking so much about uh, elevating um, people to the, to the level of, of, of a researcher. I'm just simply um, saying that we need to do more from the outset uh, to reassure parents um, that the data is being managed in um, an ethical um, and honest and transparent fashion. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Brokenshaw. Uh, Prof. Tumuleng, do you have any comment that you'd like to make on this particular question before we move on? I think let's let's attempt. I think my two colleagues have indeed, um, you know, taken up the issue quite competently, and and I would not have had much more um, to add, except to say that perhaps the the one role player who still needs to really come um, um, to, to being actively involved in this particular issue in a more flexible manner is, is our REC's, the uh, Institutional Review Boards, uh, the open-mindedness and flexibility um, about um, the nature of what they perceive to be a researcher as well as what they would perceive or understand to be a participant. Um, you mentioned the, the, the knowers, the real people of the indigenous knowledge or the experiences of their own lives who are in fact collaborators with us uh, and by no means elevating them. Um, but by virtue of their, their natural being. Uh, so, so perhaps that's where um, the, you know, 
a bit of doing needs to happen in my view. Thank you for that, uh, Prof. Meleng. All right, are there any other questions for our panelists that anybody would like to raise? Just checking to see if there is anything in the in the chat. Doesn't seem like like there are any questions in the chat box or comments. All right. It looks like there are no other questions from the floor. So I think I'll take this opportunity then just to then move towards wrapping this, uh, this session and just ask our three speakers if they have any last final points or comments that they would like to make regarding our theme of this afternoon. Any final words from, from your side, our, our speakers? No, no final comments? Prof, um, our, our hands are up, but it's possible that you can't see it um, on your screen. No, no, I can't see it on my side. Okay, Prof. But, but please, um, please go ahead. Yes, um, it's just a, a, a comment, a general comment, you know, while I was preparing for this webinar, along with uh, Prof um, Itumaling and, and Prof Engelbrecht, it really struck me talking to colleagues uh, how unaware we are uh, on campus about um, data management strategies. In fact, one or two people said they didn't know that the university had a data management policy. So um, I think it's going to be crucial uh, to, you know, Prof. Tumaling mentioned training, 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 that, that we have um, more platforms and that we begin introducing data management skills um, Perhaps even at a, <clears throat> excuse me, at an undergraduate level, and not only at a postgrad level, uh, so that we are all on the same page. So yes, um, this webinar has really um, made me aware how incredibly important it is to have these kinds of platforms. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much for for that comment. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think that Prof. Petrus is the end up from yes from Shell, and then i would just like to have a final word if you don't mind thank you it's All highly right. please please go ahead go ahead uh, prof michelle to go first oh. please Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, I just want to say that we need to be aware that we do have a number of resources on campus already that can assist us with data management. So to come back to what Susan said, um, it was really through doing the, preparing for this presentation that we realized but there is policies in place. There is the library who can assist us with putting our data on repository. There is ICT that can assist us, can assist us with keeping our um, information safe with encryption, et cetera. So I, I think we must really be aware that there are sources available to us that we might not be aware of and that um, we definitely need to start to make use of them. Thank you for that. Okay, Jim, may I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead, Prof. Hudson. 
Thank you, uh, Prof. Petrus. I just want to say, colleagues, I think that this, uh, this panel was high level and there's so much more that we can do. And I already have a lot of ideas about how we can turn this into a special series. Um, so thank you very much for the fantastic presentations. And uh, then in conclusion, I just wanted to mention that on the agenda, we also have a last session planned um, where we would reflect on the, the webinar series. But um, having spoken to, um, to Shirley, we decided that we're going to rather do it in the beginning of the new series, which will commence in 2022. So, uh, but uh, Shirley and myself will be in touch with all the speakers. We are definitely looking for the slides so that we can create a repository. And there's the data management example from the faculty on the faculty intranet so that our, our staff can access it to the benefit of their students. So that's the, my piece. And if you will excuse me, I have to rush to the other meeting. So thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hudson. And I think on that note, from my side as the chair for this afternoon session, I want to say a big thank you once again to our three speakers for being themselves and for giving us much needed food for thought on a very important topic. And I also want to say thank you to our attendees, our colleagues in the faculty in the session this afternoon. So with that, we wish you all a very restful weekend and we hope that you all stay safe and keep well, and all the best from all of us. Bye-bye. Thank you for chairing, Professor Pietrus. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you, Prof. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you.